We'll just start, we'll start up here, and we'll work in, anyway, yes, uh, my name is Robert Watson, University of Cambridge. Um, you know, many years ago, Simon, in Seoul, I led this project, been leading this project on Kerry, uh, and the mandate for this talk was a bit unclear, Peter sent me the title, and said, here's your assignment ago, which now turns out to be inaccurate, but that's okay, the title was inaccurate too. Um, I wasn't sure if people here knew about Cherry, so I've chosen to assume that you do, because all the other speakers seem to one exception, seem to know something about it. So um, I'm not going to introduce Cherry, but I will instead tell you some things that we've been thinking about and working on, and problems that we think are particularly interesting currently, uh, since it's made it to be sort of an update. So I should acknowledge all our generous sponsors of whom they've been at it for a while now, and we very much appreciate it. Um, just like I will mention So just like at a high level, what is Cherry? So Cherry is this architectural capability model, which I guess is you know, interesting from the perspective of the title of the workshop. And of course, there are many other kinds of capability systems. People have done them in operating systems, and languages, and in designing Cherry, we've tried to bring those principles into the architecture in support of languages and software structure and so on. And we're by far not the first people to have done this. There's a long history of capability systems. But I think perhaps we can assert that this is one of the most realistically deployable capability systems in that after 13 years, we've not yet demonstrated that it can't be transitioned. Um, so that's pretty good, whereas most other capability systems very quickly demonstrated that you could use them in industry and so on. So there you are. Um, what are we doing? Uh, we modify the instruction set, we then you know, can affect the compilers and the operating systems going up and we go down into microarchitecture. And we do this co-design cycle um, and in order to uh, provide security properties to software. And our focus has been very much on C and C++ plus trusted computing bases, you know, compilers and C language operating systems, all this stuff. You know, Cherry is not specific to that, but it is designed to be well-tuned to that. And so we very much support and agree with everyone who wants to do something better and beyond that. But this is what our focus has been. And lately, a big part of our focus has been on transition. And it's always been a goal to have a transitional core technology. So we live in these co-design cycles where we say, oh, this is what C does, and if you had a purest capability machine, you kind of go back and forth and try to make the two meet in the middle. And now we're doing that, I guess, on, in some sense on a much larger scale. And one interesting thing going on for the past couple of years has been some of these transition efforts. So uh, in particular, you know, the Morello system, of which I mean, a fair number of you will have Morello boards or have access to them, uh, Microsoft's uh, Chariot CPU design, which they uh, open sourced last year and is on its way to various products in various kinds of places. Uh, and actually, as well, but you know, most recently, uh, Codacip has announced a commercial product line based on Cherry Risk V, very involved in Cherry Risk V standardization. So there is this like tantalizing possibility of change in the real world. And, like, try and encourage that. Um, for those who have forgotten to learn about before coming here, you can go off and read this technical report, which is uh, well-timed and very complete, except, of course, that it is published a week or two before Morello is announced, so it doesn't say anything about Morello. Uh, but otherwise, it really talks a lot about our design approach. I'm sure it could use updating. But it, you know, so what is it all about? I'm saying we we're poking the instruction set architecture in the middle. We're still poking the instruction set architecture as we refine it uh, towards delivery. A lot of our focus today in the instruction set architecture uh, it's around things like oh, microarchitectural side channels or efficient instruction encoding. The basics of the Cherry design have actually been very stable. I mean, much longer than the Morello design. So lots of iteration going on, but you know, pretty well understood. And so now the kind of focus is pushed out into incremental refinement, or uh, and in some cases, you know, around software compartmentalization, down selecting for multiple potential design choices, all of which seem interesting and viable, but they have different trade-offs. I mean, to figure out the best trade-off for some use of the word best. Uh, and this is a long process. Every couple of years, we spit one of these instructions at architecture documents out the door. Uh, in version 8, which we published in 2020 or something, that was basically synchronized with ARM Morello. So it was intended to align with the design choices that we and ARM had come up with during our co-design cycle. Uh, we recently did uh, ISA v9, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Uh, a largely incremental, uh, and obviously incremental when you're doing you know, disrupting the instructions at architecture word we use with considerable lack of reflection. Um, we've moved to Cherry Risk V as our research architecture of choice. We were using MIPS uh, you know, from inception of the project because it was the closest thing we had to an open source 64-bit, etc. But now we have Risk V, which is markedly similar to MIPS in various ways. 
Uh, we've pulled the MIPS bit of the spec out of there, and we actually have a better elaborated x86 Cherry integration. Uh, one of our uh, sponsors and some industrial collaborators have been working with us to try and decide what would this mean? No, no, no microarchitectural work. Right? You know, how would they integrate? And, you know, the interesting news from that is that they do seem to compose very naturally and very nicely. So, over time, the name Cherry, which is order and answer risk instructions, you know, product of a, of a long shower, um, you know, the name has become successively less accurate, right? Because we've demonstrated that it isn't just MIPS, we've demonstrated now, I think, that it isn't just risk. Um, so it's actually a portable idea, which was one of the main research contributions we hoped that we might achieve. So if you think about portability across architectures, take for granted virtual memory across all these different architectures, yet yeah, spelled differently, but you know, software can make some common assumptions. This is true for Cherry as well, and it's been demonstrated you know, in the last few years rather extensively. I've now done five or six instruction set integrations, most of which are published. And I think we reasonably anticipate producing another of these documents in a year or two, uh, once we've got through the Cherry vs. 5 standardization process, because we would like our document to converge with that thing that is standardized and also capture any other ideas that we have in the next couple of years. This used to be a document we did internally and we spat it out, but it's now an open source repository on GitHub. You know, we are happy to engage with people on changes in the draft form and you know, all that stuff. Uh, so going from research to product, obviously, a big preoccupation. Uh, it's always been a co-design project, which over time we change with whom we co-design and the targets with which we are optimizing. So uh, in about 2014, we started engaging with ARM. Um, this is a byproduct of a talk done in like, the chief architect was in the room and it was a surprise. Anyway, it was, uh, the outcome has been really great, right? A long-term collaboration in 2019 uh, was announced publicly to support and innovate Morello, which is a high-performance implementation. You know, what hypotheses were we testing? Well, that we could get beyond you know, MIPS level instruction set complexity, that we could work with high performance superscalar designs. Uh, the microarchitecture was valuable, uh, valuable and like, viable at uh, gigahertz processes. All those kinds of questions. And the results of that experiment are pretty outstanding. Right? We come out with high confidence that you do high performance uh, superscalar core designs uh, in a way that we just didn't have before this. And we also have confidence that you can build a big software ecosystem on top of it, which you can't do on FPGA. You can do it. It's very, very slow. So we can now do these things, we have access to them, of course. A downside to Morello is that Morello is Morello, right? It's not, those chips are not changing out from other dust every time we have a new idea. So aspects of our software work will be fixed on the Morello view of what Cherry is, and therefore they're limited in how they progress. But the ability to validate at large scale, yes, um, you know, kind of limited. Um, Chariot is this Microsoft open source design. It is focused the entire other end of the microarchitectural spectrum. You know, three-stage, pipeline-y, tiny microcontroller thing, no virtual memory, um, but really nicely demonstrates how in a completely clean slate software ecosystem, with a bit more disruption and taking into account the constraints, I mean, benefiting from the constraints of the embedded space, such as limited memory, you can actually achieve stronger memory safety properties through this high integration that you, uh, you know, I think better sort of more efficient temporal memory safety, you're able to deploy compartmentalization in a bit more sort of interventionist kind of way. Um, and we will see, you know, where that ends up. A variety of SOCs, you know, one has been announced, uh, you know, FPGA-based platform as well, all looking pretty good. And then Codasip is kind of targeting in at this middle end. Um, they have an existing RISC-V uh, commercial design for an IP vendor, um, and now they are looking to extend that with Cherry, so customers who are integrating that design can now pick up Cherry features. And I think, you know, I'll not say too much, but I think, you know, it seems to be they have engagement from and interest from customers, and they're interested in pushing the software stack. And certainly, they're really engage with the standardization process, which is very helpful. So having vendors push through the standardization process is probably better than having just academics push through the standardization process. Uh, we have all of our open source designs. Um, these, this is no news here. Um, you know, our primary research platform has been this tuber, out of order uh, design. We can do multi-core, has MMUs. We can run basically the same software stack on Morello. We don't have GPUs in there. But otherwise, you know, it's a very complete environment. Um, different trade-offs from Morello. Morello, as I said, is a fixed point in the design space, you know, very specific microarchitecture. Uh, Tuba is parameterizable. You can decide all kinds of things about how you scale out uh, concurrency and sort of parallelism in the hardware, you know, memory latencies. Um, in some sense, a much better predictor of future microarchitecture and a place to explore those things and look at those trade-offs where we continue to design, but not able to support such a large software ecosystem. A bit about Morello. Morello is kind of, at this point, I think, like, Approach, approaching peak usefulness. So uh, these things are, are challenging. So it takes you know, two years or something to develop a thing, um, based it on a microarchitecture which is quite mature, uh, which meant that the bugs are mostly in Cherry and not in the baseline ARM design. That's completely the right choice. 
but it means it has a shelf life. Right? It will be a high performance processor design only for so many years. Uh, and why do I say it's just reaching peak usability and usefulness? It's because the software stacks are now reaching a level of maturity where you can run interesting experiments. We're beginning to understand its microarchitectural performance, its quirks, its benefits. We have performance analysis tooling coming together. So it's actually a really nice time to start work using Morello. I feel slightly sorry for everyone, including us, who started work several years ago on Morello because all that stuff wasn't there yet. But the good news is that the product of our suffering is benefit for others who want to try it out. So now it's a good time to start your snazzy research project and look at memory safety and compartmentalization and that kind of thing. Uh, ARM has manufactured you know, roughly 1,000, uh, have wafers worth of roughly 1,000 chips. They package you know, half of them. They shipped about 600 of them so far, uh, going to research labs and universities around the world. Uh, and so we're beginning to see the product of that, right? The ecosystem is forming and a community is forming, which is really great. They just go time limits much more about charity, except obviously we're very excited about that. And I hope, I mean, I think we will, this is where we will see first commercial product deployment is at the microcontroller scale. Why, why is microcontroller easier to do? Well, you don't have to bring a software ecosystem. Right? One of the biggest challenges in transition for this kind of technology is disruption to large software ecosystems. And in particular, I mean, suppose you're a large vendor who makes phones or something, right? You could use the cherry features only in your own software stack, and you could do that fairly non-disruptively, but the moment you begin to expose it to applications, applications begin to assume it's there, right? And now you can't roll that back or step it back if it was a bad idea, you're committed to further compilations of apps, all kinds of things which are very useful if you're ready to do that. But what we're seeing, not just Microsoft but elsewhere, is uh, investment in vertically integrated hardware software stacks, where a vendor has uh, custom silicon in their own ASIC designs, they are, have these security sensitive, not always microcontrollers, sometimes bigger, but you know, uh, vendor-specific you know, uh, software stacks where they can do a deployment of Cherry, try it out, decide if it's a good idea, you know, not have to convince the whole company that they want to deploy it, uh, and do you know, a trial deployment, take ownership of the technology, and kind of, like, push it out there and see what happens. And that, we're seeing that in multiple companies, which is really great. But it does mean you know, it reflects the challenge of doing something bigger like Morello, where you want to have a larger <coughs> ecosystem. Uh, low risk announced Sunburst is another uh, Innovate sponsored project. This is an FPGA board design intended and sized for working with Chariot. Um, so it's intended to make that easier, especially in the research community. A nice integration, hopefully, uh, it's all coming together. Um, but we'll make it just easy to experiment with this stuff in kind of, um, say, sort of Arduino scale computing environments. So we're quite pleased to see that happen. Uh, and then I mentioned Codasip. I think you know, one thing that excites me about Codasip it is the first commercial focused design we're seeing. Uh, as in other than Morello, but you know, it's a prototype, but first commercially like shippable design that will do MMU enabled operating systems. So the Linuxes and VSEs and SEL4s and so on will be able to run on top of that, whereas Cherry is not scaled and, and feature rich enough for that. Um, risk five standardization, uh, big focus of our activities currently. Uh, gradually working from SIG to recently to task group. Now we're allowed to standardize something, or at least write a draft specification to standardize something. Uh, but actually, the SIG and its participants have been working you know, well over a year uh, on trying to get towards the standard. And the first draft standard, I think, will, if it hasn't gone out already, you go out in the next week or two, um, which is you know, directly based on the Cambridge SRI specification. But it will see refinements, right? You have to do off code allocation, you have to size immediate, it's all kinds of trade offs, pick the exact subset that you're going to have in the first standard version. Uh, and it's really being driven by vendors, which is great, like Google and, uh, and Twitter. Say so a few words about what we're doing on Cherry memory protection. So, you know, the two focuses on Cherry have been, I'm talking about both today, I guess, but, you know, one is this sort of efficient, fine-grained memory safety for CNC++, and the other is a compartmentalization view of the world. And they have very different pitches, very different trade-offs, you know. Is it a performance overhead or a performance win? Is the adversary, like, buggy code, or is the adversary, you know, you know purposefully malicious, intentionally bad code? All that stuff. But I, for the purpose of what I'm going to say, focus a bit on memory safety. Later, Dapeng is going to talk to us a bit about his work in compartmentalization. I saw some other talks pushing in that direction as well. We used to present this co-design slide as roughly being, here are some properties we have of our capabilities, and I wonder what happens if we mix that up with C and C++. And indeed, we did do that for you know, a good half decade or decade. You know, where do pointers come from? And you know, can, if you have a memory allocation, you have to free something, that seems a bit non-monotonic, how is that gonna work? I think we're satisfied we actually understand all these properties really quite well now, and we are able to do very large-scale software deployment. Uh, I mean, we have like a last rough estimate between 60 and 100 million lines of open source CNC was compiling and apparently visibly working with many test suites passing and all this other stuff. Complicated what working means, but you know, we, we play it. The point being, actually, you know, you can run with this stuff. And if we weren't here with a flaky HDMI setup, we might have brought a umbrella box down and presented on that, which is a completely viable thing to do. 
but mostly we're now focused on some higher level questions. Um, so, you know, uh, you have heap temporal memory safety, which we deployed at scale for the first time in our software release in December. Like, what happens there exactly, right? You know, how does it interact with lockless algorithms that may dereference or use pointers to read memory? Or, uh, you know, what happens if you have memory, many layers of memory allocators in your application, your Chromium, and you have your own memory allocator, partition alloc, or, you know, how do those different layers of allocators interact? And what happens if an allocator isn't just alloc and free, right? You have slab allocators with life cycles and objects. How do all these things work together? And that's one of the things we're trying to engage with currently across some very large scale application stacks. Um, when you use it in a just-in-time compiler or you work in a language runtime that is generating its own data structures that maybe diverge a bit from our expectations about ABIs and GOBs, whatever else is on our mind. Like, are we helping them at all? Right? These are pieces of software intended to enable arbitrary code execution. So will we not impede what they need to do while also helping defend them from accidental arbitrary code execution? Do we not really interfere at all or do we get in the way a lot? We, you know, we don't know and we're running some big experiments like on V8 and others. Um, and then, you know, as you push into compartmentalization, like, what does that mean for C? Like, can you express, uh, you know, safe interaction between mutually distrusting components if you have this memory safety stuff underneath, or is it, you know, a bit more complicated? Obviously, a bit more complicated. You know, how do we how do we do this stuff? Another question we've been pushing on quite hard lately is what I should the word even should appear in here, but it's like, what do we even mean by C and C++ memory safety? Like, it's clear to us, I think, what some nice examples of unsafe. Plus R, but you know, when you start approaching this ideal of can we make it a memory safe language, leave types out, out of the picture. Like, what does it mean for Z to be memory safe? It's really unclear. It's very messy. Um, and so we've been kind of working on this in what I think of as a very pragmatic sense. Our definition of memory safety is it seems to be less exploitable, and we do it in a very systems kind of way, very empirical. Um, but also, you know, it's a bit you know, unsatisfying in various ways. So we've been trying to push on that. Um, a big thing that we pitch in Jerry course is determinism, like a lack of dependence on secrets and that it always works reliably for the definitions that we provide. And there's a lot of room for that to go wrong. Uh, and where, you know, in these very complex software stacks that we might not understand things like compiler and undefined behavior or, you know, the difference between use after free and use after reallocation and how do we feel about that? Um, all kinds of stuff. How do you compose with uninitialized values, which aren't something that, you know, we attempt to solve and yet we need to integrate with the mitigation that exists already, or ideally not just call them mitigations, right? You know, go from mitigating vulnerabilities to memory safety, whatever that may mean. Um, but like I said, we're driving in a very pragmatic, you know, kind of direction. Our, our chief metric is vulnerability mitigation, and we'd like to get the vast majority of memory safety vulnerabilities. You know, we can edge towards more of them. We can maybe move away depending on performance trade-offs and security trade-offs. So in fact, you know, we think of memory safety for C and C++ as a space. There are lots of points in that space as you begin to play with uh, adversary models and you begin to like push a little bit harder and more disruptively on the C language. You know, one challenge for us has been, uh, been circulating these ideas for a while now, but you know, around sub-object bounds. So, like when you're talking about objects in the C language, term I use incautiously, um, you know, we feel fairly confident something about bounds being you know, kind of at least the size of the object and if they're bigger than the object, maybe some padding. But that all starts to sound good. But when we work with sub-objects, which C decidedly more hazy about what that even means, um, we find there's a, there's a rich exploit space of sort of structs that contain arrays that overflow into pointer fields and so on, and we'd like to know what we can do about it, and is it worth doing something about it? Should our definition of memory safety include solving those problems? Um, right now, we have some compiler features, we deploy them, we use them, um, but they generate a bit more friction for adoption. They disrupt your C code a little bit more. So that's what I mean by the space. So, you know, adoption friction, whether it's performance overhead or lines of code versus uh, you know, this empirical notion of vulnerability mitigation. We can measure the benefit of sub-object bounds, we can measure some of the costs, but it's complicated about whether that's what we should mean. Um, and then we have this sort of increasingly sort of compartmentalization-oriented focus in which maybe the adversary model slips from bugs, memory safety bugs in C towards active exploitation by malicious code. Uh, and what does that mean? That interacts with the ABI, uh, the layers below the language. So. Often in our work, we talk about like uh, you know sub-language protections, protecting GOTs and PLTs and things. And I think that's obviously like a good idea to limit exploits, but also that is a very important element of isolation. Uh, and there, there's a very complicated discussion to have about. C. So I'll just like flip forward a little bit, maybe talk about a case study for that. So one area we've been doing a lot of recent work. This is work by Alfredo Mzingi, one of my PhD students and now research engineers. Uh, and he's basically taken the previous C kernel, which is a million, million lines of code. I think we took the core kernel, so basically 
throw away the device drivers, but we're not using them on FPGA. Let's do it. Okay, not the GPU drivers and 802 just like the core kernel, which is about two and a half million lines of code. We went through and we did all the spatial safety stuff. We taught the memory allocators and the VM system and all those things about it. We you know, interaction with the user level in different ways and ABIs and mm -hmm. the pointers through the kernel, all kinds of stuff. Uh, we don't yet have temporal memory safety for the heap in the kernel. It's a, quite a different question what that means versus user level temporal memory safety where we have an increasingly good grasp of what we want in the kernel. The kernel memory allocators are custom allocators. They're like these things I described for like web browsers. There are slab allocators and reuse of things and multiple memory mappings for the same object and you know, all kinds of great stuff that we don't understand. So we'll, we'll work on that. Um, but we can use this large scale case study to explore the impact on a piece of code that is really aware of memory allocation right, and what our intervention has to be. So have this thing up and running. Then we can evaluate with respect to vulnerabilities. So the kernel, for various reasons, uh, has a slightly lower percentage rate of memory safety vulnerabilities than most of the user level software we look at. That doesn't mean it has fewer memory safety vulnerabilities per lines of code. It means there are other things that can be vulnerable. So if you have software that has access control in it, like a kernel or a database, you have more access control bugs that are vulnerabilities. And so they begin to pick up uh, you know, exploits and, uh, and you know, patches and so on. So when we look at Postgres and use level, when we look at previously kernel, we find these access control vulnerabilities that don't exist in you know, whatever random web server it is. Like, you know, simply, there isn't enough access control to be interesting. So we should take with a grain of salt the slightly lower percentage and just assume it's also just buggy kernel code. Right. And then we sort of work through and we say, okay, well, you know, a bit over half of them are spatial and pointer related bugs. And of those, 8% um, of them have to do with sub-objects. So there are real sub-object vulnerabilities in kernels. We find some, for example, in the Linux kernel where a few years ago, there was an array in a device driver data structure uh, in the kernel for USB, and uh, there was a race condition reading a length out of the device, and the device could send one length back one time and a different length back a different time, and the kernel would just like, overflow straight into the control structures in the kernel, and oops, kernel privilege. So those things exist, uh, and we can mitigate them. But should we mitigate them? I mean, personally, we should. Um, but it's more complicated with respect to C because it's not objects. You don't know what they are in C. So, and then so on. Like, you know, we can also look at things like uninitialized values. Yes, we don't solve that problem, but LLVM has some stuff. You know, it initializes things. It doesn't get all of the uninitialized vulnerabilities because zero fills, and sometimes zero is exploitable. But you know, most of the time, zero is not exploitable, so it's better. So how do we compose with that? We can do that evaluation, too, and then ask what the composed performance cost is or the proposed uh, change to source code. Uh, and the good news is, like, this is one of the most complicated pieces of software that we have adapted for Cherry. Uh, and we did three different architectures with Cherry support, one FTE about two and a half years. That's pretty small curve to many kernel changes. That is totally decent. Obviously, like, FreeBSD kernel is not Windows, but it is a pretty complicated real kernel in most other senses. It is typical of what one would find in kernels like Linux and Solaris and iOS and so on. Same kind of code. Same kind of code. Um, we also have to be, by the way, a bit careful. We do these empirical studies where we're like past vulnerabilities. We should be very careful to pay attention to selection bias and what those vulnerabilities are. Right? They they're fatty. They come in waves. People are like, oh, we've discovered integer overflows. Or you know, this week we have kernel address sanitizer. You, know, you can see these waves of vulnerability patterns. And as we turn up and begin to help solve some of these things, we can expect that to change. Right? And we expect it to change anyway. So we can't accurately predict the future. But I guess this is as good as we can get in most senses. So it's the methodology we have more about that. Um, temporal safety is a big focus of our work. We've just, as I said, shipped uh, heap temporal safety for use level for the first time. Uh, I mean, maybe the intuition which I have on the slide is like uh, the capability system revocation <coughs> problem is the use after free problem in the way in which we bring capabilities and languages together. And one thing we know about capability systems is revocation is hard because it requires notions of centralization and synchronicity that are like, antithetical to decentralized designs. And oops, a contemporary processor is a decentralized design. So we have chosen you know, the be more decentralized at the cost of lack of synchronicity uh, in revocation. And revocation for us is quite expensive. So we've spent quite a long time, many years, thinking about how to do revocation. Increasingly high performance implementations that use virtual memory to track pointers, all kinds of cool things that you should read about in the ASPLOS paper that we've uh, accepted for this next ASPLOS. And the camera already went in yesterday, or tomorrow, something like that. It'll be online very, very soon. Uh, we are inspired by garbage collection techniques. Uh, and if you install CherryBSD from Morello today, you, this is just on by default, um, you know, with all the complexities running with experimental virtual memory extensions and files. So, worth a try. Uh, but actually, it kind of works for us. And we'll ship batch release in March. That will also work for us. So. Um, but what is the main achievement of this generation versus like the previous stuff? It's getting pause times down. So 
uh, with Morello, we were uh, sorry with Morello using cornucopia, which is our previous generation like stool side approach, uh, looking at 30 millisecond pause times, which is really not good. Uh, and now we have it down to about 10 microseconds, which is like decent, I think, for the way we are, like, completely acceptable for our purposes. There is a separate optimization space, which we don't yet understand, around uh, reducing memory traffic, uh, which is very important to us and is a key viability question, but not answered by this work. Right? It kind of maintains the status quo uh, from the previous paper. Uh, so what are we doing? Well, we're experimenting with temporal safety at scale. This is an interesting thing to do. Uh, we made it easy to disable. That's very important. Um, but we're looking for experience, and not just like, did it work for you, and maybe did it mitigate your vulnerabilities, although obviously we care about that. We're also interested in these harder design questions, like, so you have your custom allocator that either is or is not led on top of the current allocator, or maybe talks to NMAP, you know, do, do these ideas work for you, right? Do they work with your application specific memory allocator? Well, the first we will look at there uh, is the partition allocator in Chromium, but we're interested in all the others too. Uh, and so we'd love to get feedback and your thoughts, and you know, happy to collaborate with you you have a beautiful case study, we would like to have that in a paper together or something, it would be wonderful. Right? And then also, uh, compartmentalization, like temporal safety is obviously, to me, obviously critical to compartmentalization. Interestingly, we only brought it in now, but like, how does that work for communication between new distrusting parties? Do we need notions of memory ownership when we're transferring? You know, it's all, all interesting, like tons of research problems. Good for papers, hopefully we can get them solved before someone tries to like, use it in real um, another thing we've been playing with lately, I'm going too much longer, but is a, uh, you know, an interesting side effect of the architecture is that you can find all the pointers. That is what lets us do our heap temporal safety work. You can just go find them all, right, and revoke things and look for them and do cute atomicity tricks with the and all that stuff. But we can use it for other purposes. So we've had a long running thread of research where we look at the traces coming out of emulators or we scan through memory trying to analyze software behavior. And you know, the, like the implied hypothesis is like, this affects reverse engineerability. It gives us new tools for testing gives us new tools for understanding and visualization. And indeed, we can do that. We can go like look at all the capabilities. We can draw graphs. We can have invariants on those graphs and test them as we go through software deployment. Um, we can look at what attackers would do. We can help attackers, I suppose, uh, in understanding potential vulnerabilities in our own designs. So that's really quite uh, a useful thing. I mentioned one other piece of memory safety related research, which is uh, some work by uh, Peter's group we collaborated with. Uh, and that's looking at uh, formal semantics and in particular undefined behavior make a throwaway comment, which is like, you know, we say maybe we're doing something about memory safety, you know, oh, you ran off the end of the array and somebody generated a fault or something and like didn't generate a spatial safety bug. Peter comes up and says, well, that's very nice, but you know that going off the end of the array is undefined behavior. The compiler can do anything it wants, including decide not to implement your memory safety properties. Now, it's complicated. So it was a very nice paper uh, in the last year or two looking at how address sanitizer and other debugging tools get optimized out by the compiler and stop working. Uh, which is you know, a great research result and also slightly embarrassing for everyone. On the whole, we haven't been seeing a lot of that. Our compiler integration is very different, but there are all kinds of interesting potential problems. And actually, there's a bit of a problem for us with undefined behavior generally, which is probably we need some of that undefined behavior to become a little bit more defined if we're going to have a useful outcome. So now, oh gosh, one of those co-design cycles. Um, I guess we'll do that for a bit and see where we end up. Uh, Robert, yes, when would you like me to finish? Speaking of temporal safety, yes. Um, <laughs> when I can stop any time, but I can say a few more words if you would like. Yeah. So, so, so now you're at the end of your notional slot. Yes. And we should also allow the audience to interrupt you. And yeah. You can do that. I could so say some. Should I say some uh, like one minute of controversial words and see where it goes? I, I think in the end we will end up eating like ten minutes of the break. So you might speak for another minute or two. Okay. And another minute or two. Or three. So an argument we've been starting to make when talking to people who are interested in memory safety, of course, there are an increasing number is, you know, have you noticed that you know, in six months we can write more memory safe code than the entire Rust open source ecosystem has written in six years? Um, now, we make that argument carefully, and like, hopefully non-offensively, because it's not that we don't believe in Rust. We think Rust is a great idea. You should write your new software in this memory safe language which supports all kinds of constructs that don't just mitigate vulnerabilities, but maybe prevent bugs. And that is all good. But, you know, also, you have this 12 billion lines of C and C++ code lying around, and that's just the open source stuff. And if you were to rewrite all of that in Rust, first, you would never finish, and second, it would be a catastrophe, because you wouldn't have your test suites, and it would just be all the new, it would be bad. So if you want to deploy memory safety quickly, should you not be pursuing both strategies, right? Bring, pursue all the goodness of proofs in SEO4 and type safe and memory safe languages, but also should you not do cherry along the way, because you might be able to get to your goal a lot more quickly. So, you know, the hypothesis there is, you know, could you get to a completely memory-safe software ecosystem 
in a really finite amount of time, if you're willing to blend these technologies and let them benefit from each other, and also not yet fully have answered all those annoying questions from the people who are worried about undefined behavior in compilers and stuff. So this is a, an interesting, maybe controversial thing to think about. Another question like we have been engaging with quite a lot in the past few months is like, how can you ask for memory safety? So if you're developing technologies like Cherry and all the cool things people are doing with it, like pretty hard, I think, like top end of like research challenging things. Um, but then you know, there's the procurement problem, which turns out to be even harder. So if you want to deploy technologies like this, you have these annoying supply chain problems where the people who make the software aren't the people who make the hardware aren't the people who design the architect, you know, it's all bad. Um, so this is an even harder problem. And one of the key aspects of that turns out to be you want a tick box in your, perform, in your procurement form that says, I want memory safety. So, and it doesn't have to be committed to any specific technology. Like if your router turns up written with the TCP and Rust, like, cool. Um, but, you know, or if it's Cherry or whatever it is, but today you cannot ask for that. In fact, I was at uh, DOD in December and we're having a conversation about today, Department of Defense can't ask for stack canaries because there's no procurement tick box that says everything has to be compiled with stack canaries. Now, that means, and they've looked, it's not. Like, how can there be software without stack canaries? Like, that's been going on for a while now. Anyway, they can't even tick that box. So there's a good discussion to be had. And that discussion is a hard discussion. Like, some of it is technical. Like, what does memory safety mean? It's like a bit philosophical. And then, like, more concrete questions. Like, how do I know if you're using memory safety at all well? Right. Yes. All kinds of hard things. But ultimately, if you want to transition these memory safety technologies, it is actually important to engage with this stuff. And I think there is a technical contribution, a philosophical contribution that can come out of our community, even though we will have to talk to the procurement people. So there you are. Where do we, how do we, how do we perceive it? I don't know, we start with workshops and we think about it and we have coffee and we do all that stuff. But within a year or so, we need to be talking to the likes of NIST and others about how you would write standards because you can't have a US government procurement tech box without a NIST standard, basically. You need to explain what it means. It needs to be testable, it needs to be pretty concrete, and it can have trade-offs that we're not all happy with, but you have to be able to tell if you got it. So we need to think a little bit about that. I want to talk to this, but I guess you know, maybe one very last thought to end with is like, we have to think a lot about how to compare with other memory safety technologies. And a philosophical view that we've taken is we're not competing with the other technologies. We'd like to you know, exist ideally in composition with them and make them better and fill the gaps they've left behind and so on. And so the Rust comparison is really instructive. It's like, yeah, with us, you don't rewrite the entire software ecosystem, but on the other hand, like new hardware, they say, oh, but, you know, we have memory ownership concepts which prevent bugs, and we say, you know, but maybe we can help you with the exploitable code your Rust compiler is generating when you have C library, you know, all these kind of things go hand in hand together, but I think we need a much clearer understanding of that composition story to make the argument effectively, right? This is all hand-waving, right? I mean, yeah, beyond hand-waving, so kind of collaborating on that kind of thing. It's pretty exciting. So, I don't know, I think we're probably about done with anything interesting to say. Oh, maybe one last thing, sorry, Peter. And that's, you know, uh, on the language and co-design thing, I mean, right now, our grand challenge on memory safety is to get a memory safe web browser, uh, like at scale. Uh, and we've made some real progress in the past few months. So like, it's like nine staff months of work or something into this so far as a context switching. But, uh, you know, V8 is finally starting to run with optimization and JITs and things, and this is pretty cool. Uh, you know, what does it mean? No idea. You know, that's an evaluation question, and there are trade offs and all this good stuff. Uh, but, you know, and we're also, by the way, working on UEFI currently, so we're trying to get down into the firmware. I mean, the goal is to have a 100%, you know, pure capability, cherry enabled, ideally mostly temporarily safe, you know, complete working computer system. Because we think that is a very compelling demonstrator of what's possible if you have this kind of technology. So, and we're interested in all the stuff that everyone else is doing in the same space because it's just one narrative around a brand challenge. Good. We have time for, like, you know, minus 10 minutes of questions. So we should have a few questions. Um, please wait for uh, one of us to give you a microphone. We can also have no questions. It's, that's true. You all agree it's fine. So you talked about interactions or, or the, the relation between Cherry and Rust. So do, do you have any thoughts on the interac the, the relation between Cherry and? They should, shouldn't they? Sure, yeah. but uh, so my question uh, is. I have I've also thought some problems, but I don't really have solutions. So. Right, but my my question was, do you have any thoughts on the relation between Cherry and and uh, verification and and like formal verification series? Uh, and we should do that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so, like, what does that mean? I wonder. Um, so, we, as Peter was saying earlier, our co-design cycle has included formal modeling and proof around the instruction set level of the world, right? We, you know, we, there are a couple of papers, like, you know, by Morello, formally verified architecture with isolation from and things. So, and that's, I think, is the necessary and critical starting point, and that's really good that we've done that. Um, and we need to make sure we do that for cherry risk by standard is shipped. Um, but as, you know, uh, as with the co-design problem, like down into microarchitecture, up into software, and I think you know I don't have good ideas about how you do either of those things. Um, I think around Rust, and the sure formal verification, you know, a really interesting question is how do the security properties align? Because the, you know, the necessary first step for Rust is you know, get Hello World working and then benchmarks, all that, you know. But none of that says anything about the security properties you achieve by doing it. I think there's kind of like the language level of properties that would be interesting to think about. And there's also the generated code properties. And both of those are kind of a new space, right? Which you have to revisit a bunch of the questions that arose in C and C++ and then ask about the composition between the two as well. Um, you know, I do have like very whiteboardy ideas on that. I don't, you know, we've never done it. Uh, and we would love to do that kind of thing. Um, I think, you know, obviously, as you go up into software verification, there are some efforts around Chariot to do that, for example. They, the TCB and Chariot are like 100 and something instructions. You know, they can't prove those instructions correct. We've really done something wrong. Uh, we can't prove those instructions correct with minor refinements. We've done something wrong. Uh, but getting beyond that, you know, I mean, when I talk about, oh, we run a 100 million lines of code or something, I, you know, formal verification steps usually don't scale that way. But can we at least get some useful little properties that are universal? And unlike around language stuff as well, right? You know, what does this thing mean? Like a formal model of C, how does Cherry fit into that? It's complicated. Sorry, lots of people should do things. It's always the answer. Hello, Robert. Thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask you about the possibility of, uh, or the danger, I suppose, of a splintering in the ecosystem as more people are uh, developing different uh, Cherry systems and how you would prevent that or whether you see it as a good thing. A splintering is, like, I think, it's a judgmental word, right? Um, yeah, sorry. And I, you know, I'm not... A divergence, there's a perhaps. There's a legitimate use of that word, which is like, if you, and this is something we are very concerned about, like, suppose cherry means so many different things to so many different people that no one can agree on what it means, agree on what you get out of it, and the software ecosystem is so fragmented, you don't build a critical mass and you don't have a sustainable ecosystem. That would be very bad. Um, but, you know, another perspective is, that, well, maybe you're tuning cherry to specific use cases. And one, that's one reason Chariot is super interesting, is that in the very small memory constraint, they can achieve much more interesting temporal safety properties. And that is really cool. But what does that mean about software portability? So mm -hmm. um, part of the why I want to engage with the standardization side of things, like Cherry RS5, we'd like everyone to converge. I mean, there are many vendors you know, talking about shipping Cherry RS5 things. Most of them are very similar to each other, but then, you know, they're standard. So you know, they're very, I think the intention pretty much everyone we talk to is convergence there, we'll see how we encourage that through this. Uh, we have been very careful to make sure the software models are as close as possible across them, and that problem will only get more complicated as we say, oh, but maybe we like Rust 2 and stuff, right? That's, that's tricky. Um, but there's also some, some fuzziness, right? Right now, you can get divergences in software behavior, because this one's more bounds of this size, and that one maybe has slightly like, stronger temporal safety. To some extent, we can like wash over that and say, you know, this is the implementation of behavior, but if you take that too far, it's a bit of a mess. And an area that I think I'm particularly concerned about is compartmentalization semantics. Um, you know, we are still, many people are working on this, like trying to figure out what compartmentalization should be, what it means, and the best way to use the technology. And we have multiple prototypes for experimenting with nothing about one of them. Um, but you know, uh, compartmentalization is about like software models and operational behavior. And we provide primitives. And so it doesn't, you know, the, the beauty is the flexibility. We can support many different operational models. The challenge is what if we do, uh, and no one can agree on what they are, and they all behave differently. And you get vulnerabilities, right? Or you get software non portability. And I don't think we understand how to solve that problem except to demonstrate in as portable a way as possible some models that work really well. So the thing we've been working closely with ARM on is like, you know, we've been running ahead of like five years ahead of time. We'll try temporal safety stuff, and kernel compartments and all these things. But we're trying to lead behind like a technology roadmap, which is here are some good ways to use technology. Why don't we converge wherever we can on APIs? Like it would be nice if Linux and BSD and iOS and whatever else maybe in the future supports it, right? Basically behave the same way. Like you have reasonable expectations. And I guess that the best we can do is kind of like do that. I mean the, the reassuring thing is that and we come out of decades of experience, like people copy and paste stuff, right? And so it's like a very powerful tool that you provide a reference design that works, like a, it's like functions, people will probably just steal it. 
Um, and that is the most powerful tool we have for convincing people to converge, is to provide reference design that people will use unthinkingly in the deployment of their stuff. And so we have to both take responsibility for good reference designs, but also like, build the things that people will steal and hopefully then converge. It's a race against time. You have to have enough of the stuff together that they copy and paste the best thing and not the first thing. Um, sorry, pragmatic answer from this person. That's quite quickly. I want to revisit your answer to the first question, where you said that uh, in the context of Rust, I have many questions. I wonder whether those were high-level uh, design um, research questions, aims, or because it's Rust, the Rust features uh, together with uh, Cherry throw this uh, opportunity or this problem. Well, I think the biggest question I have up front is like, if you compose the two, do you get something that's greater than the sum of the parts? You don't just get Rust running on a machine that has Cherry, but you get a better Rust or Rust that supports new kinds of things. And you know, the easy, I mean, the straightforward first things to test are like the integration of native code with Rust code. So you, know, you use this machine learning library with your Rust piece of software. And what you want to know is that vulnerabilities on the machine learning side don't impact Rust safety, for example. And that is not, I mean, that's good research. Um, but it's going to be a little bit more straightforward, I think. Uh, I think the sort of more challenging questions are around things like you know, Cherry provides the opportunity for engaging with malicious code you know, with a compartmentalization model. Rust has very strong trust to the compiler and is not really intended to engage with the malicious code problem at a generated code level. And the real world involves apps, right? I mean, it was constantly downloading apps. So you know, could you actually have a Rust that knows how to deal with uh, maliciously written Rust compiled by someone else inside your software ecosystem? Because if you can, then we've really gained something for the deployability of Rust. Um, and I think, you know, and of course there's all the mechanical challenges and there's like, what does memory safety mean differs and uh, do Rust things map into Cherry? Th those are all good questions, but I think there may be some opportunities we could really exploit to make both technologies better. And you've now reached the edge of my understanding. Like I, th I see opportunity, I think, as you had expressed it. Mm -hmm. Should I go sit down? I think, I think we should yeah. move on to Conrad. Thank you. Um, but thank you again. <laughs>